series with uh, Rabbi Batya Glazer, co-sponsored by the Jewish Community Relations Council. Um, and I'll say, uh, I'll give my introduction to Rabbi Batya first and then say a little bit more about how we all came to be here tonight. Um, people, people are often curious to know what is it like to be the rabbi of a synagogue where so many of the members of the synagogue are rabbis. Um, and it is an unqualified pleasure. Um, it's, it is not without significance that the Talmudic term for one's fellow rabbi is the same Hebrew word chaver that we use to mean a friend. Um, it is a distinct pleasure and privilege to be able to serve in a community where there are other rabbis like Rabbi Batya to uh, be a sounding board for ideas for conversations for challenging ideas and uh, all kinds of things that um, I, you know, my life would be, my, my personal life, my work life would be uh, impoverished. And I am really feel blessed, um, Baya, to have you as a chaver in all of the many different senses of that word. Um, for those who don't know her already, Rabbi Batya Glazer is the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. She sits on the board of St. Joseph's University Institute for Jewish Catholic Relations. She's a member of the council and the admin group of Interfaith Philadelphia, a member of the Inter-Jewish Muslim Alliance, and a member of the Philadelphia Board of Rabbis. She has a BA in political science from Rutgers University a Master of Hebrew Letters degree from the University of Judaism, and a Master's degree in Rabbinic Ordination from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. Batya has worked in Jewish education at all levels and at a number of social service agencies. She has three children, lives in Center City, Philadelphia, and is, uh, most important to me, a member of BZBI. Um, and as we're uh, just kind of getting wrapped up here, um, I want to encourage you, uh, if you are not a member of BZBI, uh, if you're not someone who is already supporting the work of the JCRC, um, you didn't come here to hear me speak, so you can use this time to uh, go to BZBI's website and to the Jewish Federation website and make a contribution supporting uh, the work that we're doing that is enabling us to uh, bring this series of conversations to you and so much else that we are doing in the community and that the JCRC is doing in the community. Um, some of you know some of the story of how we got here tonight uh, because you were part of a JCRC uh, sponsored trip along with the Kaiserman JCC and uh, the ADL through uh, Georgia and Alabama last November that uh, my wife Rebecca Krasner and I had a privilege of uh, joining that trip. Uh, but the story for me goes back um, even deeper than that. I um, I suppose I'm third generation Southern. Um, I'm named for my great grandfather, Pop Stein, who uh, went from Kiev to Galveston, Texas. And when Galveston didn't suit him, he made his way to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where his children were born. And uh, when my grandmother, blessed memory, was a teenager, moved the family to Mobile, Alabama, where my father grew up. Uh, and I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and so the 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 history that we were learning about on the November mission is deeply connected to my family's history. And, um, and I grew up in the ambivalence of being Jewish in the South. Um, and when I say ambivalence, I mean that in a number of ways. Um, the ambivalence of appearing white and benefiting from the privileges of whiteness while not being part of the mainstream normal, if you will, because we didn't go to church on Sunday, we went to church on Saturday. Um, the ambivalence of feeling a connection to social justice and also recognizing the precariousness of the Jewish community as a minority community in the South. And if that was somewhat muted in uh, my own childhood, um, certainly my father of blessed memory would tell me stories of working in, uh, in his father's store 
and needing to observe and even sometimes enforce the white water fountains and the colored water fountains, the white bathrooms and the colored bathrooms. Um, you know, white people came in the front of the store and were helped by sales attendants. Um, African Americans went around the back of the store and came through the service entrance. And this was the reality that my father was raised in. And, um, you know, I never talked about it with my grandparents, um, but my uncles and my father shared with me their sense that, um, you know, their parents may not have necessarily felt like all of that segregation was right or warranted or justified, um, but they certainly weren't about to stick their own necks out to rock the boat and do something about it. Um, you know, in an era in which the Klan was marching, marching in the streets, in an era in which um, their synagogue was at one point defaced with anti-Semitic graffiti. Um, and that's that ambivalence of, uh, of being Jewish in the South. Um, and, this, and this question of confronting racism as Jews, um, you know, how do we as members of a minority community who are by and large regarded as white people in this country, um, how do we encounter the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow and uh, economic discrimination and education discrimination as it continues in our country? Um, and uh, particularly as I hope these conversations will lead us to, as it manifests right here in Philadelphia around us, um, even you know, to the level, um, I was talking about this with some of our board members and our associate rabbi, Rabbi Annie Lewis, um, when you start to look at the zip code level data on COVID-19 cases, and, um, you know, and I, I knew because we were having a conversation about the synagogue the other night, you know, we looked at the data for 19103 and for 19146 and 19147 and 19102, and they don't look like the countywide average. Um, you know, our, the neighborhoods that by and large BZBI's congregants and preschool families and Hebrew school families are coming from are seeing substantially lower impacts of uh, what's happening and substantially lower financial impacts. And our kids are in schools that are able to deliver a different level of distance learning. Um, so we're sitting with all of this and um, I'm really, I feel really comforted that there are so many people from across the Jewish community who have uh, turned out to be a part of tonight um, because this grew out of the November mission, um, grew out of the question of having learned about the history, having really immersed ourselves in what the legacy of racism in America looks like, then what? All right, what do we do? Where do we go? Where do we take this now that we're home? Um, and so it is uh, with deep gratitude that I uh, look to you, Rabbi Batya, to pick up the thread from there. Thank you. First, I want to say how lovely it is to see everyone. I, I have to say I've been looking forward to this conversation, but, but I clearly have been in the house for a while because even though I feel I'm with my family, I feel very safe and loved and have lots of company. It's so good to see you all. Thank you for being here on this, on this experience tonight. Um, so as Abe shared with you, I'm the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council. I am not a professor. I am not a historian. I'm not a scholar. This is not meant to be a frontal lecture. Um, what I have been blessed with is the privilege of talking to a lot of people um, and listening to a lot of people, obviously, more importantly. I, I've um, been to many interracial and interfaith dialogues. I've been to conferences and civil rights missions. Um, I've had conversations with friends. You know, as director of the JCRC and my last position, I was uh, director of best title ever, social justice and interfaith initiatives. I got to walk into rooms and say, hi, do you want to talk about racism? Right, don't, don't do that, right? That's not something that is a good idea. But because that was my professional role, I, I actually got to have those conversations in a very direct and honest way. Um, 
And, and I value that. There are not many settings where you can be that direct and get such a candid and frank response about issues of race. Um, and I want to thank everyone um, in the Black community, everyone in the Jewish community, everybody who has made it possible for me to have those conversations and learn as much as I have. Um, and I am hoping that we are going to have an opportunity here to actually engage the subjects together in conversation. Um, this is a technological uh, challenge. Luckily, I have Jason and David Haas, Jason Haltzman, who is the program officer for the JCRC. God bless Jason. Um, and David Haas, who is communications director for BZBI, who will be helping me manage those breakout groups so that we will be able to engage in conversations together. Um, please, I, I am apologizing in advance for every insensitive, inappropriate, and misuse of phrase that I managed to use during the next uh, hour and a half. Um, you can't have hard conversations without sometimes saying the wrong thing. So I apologize. I'm doing my best. I'm open to correction. Um, and I would rather be open and honest um, than be safe. So in this conversation, we're going to be focusing on anti-Black racism in an American context. This is not meant to address the entire um, complexity of race and racism in the United States of America. Right? We are not discussing anti-Latino racism or anti-Asian racism. There, there are, this is the beginning of our conversations and we are going to focus tonight on anti-Black racism in an American context. Um, what is the obvious problem as we use language? Right? Jews are not white in the sense that Jews identify and belong to many racial groups. Right? We want to be very respectful of that. Um, but we also know that not all Jews identify themselves as white. So even the language of white Jews, some people will be uncomfortable with that and say, I'm not white. On the other hand, if you talk about Jews, you're definitely not going to be talking about it appropriately because you're going to leave out um, 12 to 15 percent of the Jewish population, which does not identify as white. It's 12 to 15 percent, both in uh, the Philadelphia region and nationwide, um, identify as Jews of color. Um, but the importance of discussing race cannot be overstated. Uh, Jim Wallace refers to racism in America as America's original sin. Um, it's part of the foundation of the country. And to be able to talk about it and understand how we are being heard and what we bring to it when we speak from a Jewish lens really does matter. Right. Um, first, I want to talk for a moment about why we need to have this conversation as Jews and as Jews who certainly look white. Um, our identities matter. Our identities are complex and important. Our narratives, our understandings of who we are are the lens through which we see everything. And if we don't understand who we are and what we're bringing to the conversation, we're not going to be able to have the conversation in the same way. Um, if we don't know our perspective, we're going to get tripped up on it. It's going to, it's going to get in the way. Um, so for all of those who are participating, who identify as um, Jews of color or black, or not white, or not Jews, but are part of our community, um, thank you all for being here. And again, I apologize for the next time I offend you. Um, <clears throat> uh, all right. So I'm going to suggest a few guidelines uh, 
guideline rules. I've tried to keep them short. Often you get the dialogue, decalogue. There are a lot of rules of dialogue that are quite long and we have to study them together. And I love those. They're so thoughtful and we're just not going to do that. So I'm going to give you a very short list of rules before I put everybody into breakout groups. All right, for the purposes of our conversations, please assume that everyone you're talking to is a person of goodwill. Right? Anybody who's bothered to be here tonight, bothered to be here tonight. Right? Whatever anybody says or thinks, they came to the conversation. That's a lot. Um, never call anybody a racist. Calling people's names does not contribute to a fruitful conversation. Even if you think they're a racist, don't tell them that. Um, ask questions instead of informing people what they just said. Right? Never say, you think, you told me, you said, you believe. Right? The, the classic reframing is to ask questions and use I statements. What I heard you say was, right? That's always a good one. <laughs> what I heard you say was, right? Um, or this is, when I hear that, I feel, right? Or that idea is uncomfortable for me, right? Talk about yourself. Don't assign people ideas or thoughts or what they said. Um, and Harris Sokoloff, who does uh, dialogue training, uh, recently said at the beginning of a, one of those dialogue trainings, come to the conversation willing to be changed. Um, and I am so grateful you were all here. And I am definitely open to, to learning from all of you tonight. Thank you. So we're going to put everyone into breakout groups with Jason's help. And the question will be, for those Jews here who look white, do you consider yourself white? And, and if you don't, how would you characterize your relationship to whiteness? Um, and I don't, from what I see here, right, I was talking to some people of color adjacent folks about the challenge of doing this with breakout groups. Because if we are setting, sending off white looking people to talk about whiteness, that could be, an, it's like an awkward place to be for people who don't identify as white at all, and don't look white. Because obviously if you are not white, you're going to have a different and everyone can identify you as not white, you're going to have a different relationship to the conversation. I don't see a lot of folks who, who appear obviously um, not white. The, our thought was, because we're going to do automatic assignments of breakout groups, that um, if you would like to stay in the main room and talk amongst yourselves as people who are obviously not white, you are welcome to do that. Um, if you are not, but I don't really see a crowd of people who are likely to choose that, but it is certainly an option for you. Oh, I'm so happy to see someone here from the ADL. It's always good to have an ADL guy on the call. Hi, Jeremy, thanks for being here. And so many people who have been helpful for me in how to frame this conversation. Great, Jason. We're going to put people in groups of seven to eight people, um, that being the definition of a small group, but beyond eight, you've got a large group. Um, and if you'd like to talk for, say, 15 minutes, I don't want to leave you there too long, but I'm sure you can find things to talk about. So talk for 15 minutes about your relationship to whiteness and how you identify yourselves. Have fun. Can you close the door?
I'm unsure what just happened. Oh, the breakout room's closed. We're returning back to the main session. Thank you. We were just in the middle of a, of a discussion, yes. I'm sure that everyone was. Thank you. Jeremy. How you doing, Jason? I'm good, how are you? Good, I like the beard. Yeah, it's got the quarantine beard going. <laughs> it's already been trimmed once. I don't want to do it again. But I'm Looking back. good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Don't tell anybody it's quarantine, Jason. Tell them it's for the Omer. <laughs> that too. You seem very devout. Except yesterday was Lagba Omer, so you can't. Hey, cut Jeremy, it off. how are you? Good. How are you doing, Benina? <laughs> I'm okay. Good. good. Cool good. to see you. You too. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Panina. Hi, Panina. It's so nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Elaine. <laughs> Every meeting is kind of a little bit like the Walton going to bed at night, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Hi, Rosa. Order for group one. Share, share something that interested you, something that you hadn't thought of before, something you want to share. Be bold, because I don't know who was in which group, and I can't call on people. You and you need to unmute yourself before you talk. Um, did you call in group one, Bacha? Did. So um, I had the pleasure of meeting um, Regina Levin, who shared about having um, adopted kids of color and what it means to be part, you know, identifying as white but being part of a family that identifies in a different way. And as we were ending. Um, Melissa, if I'm getting the name right, mentioned a book called um, White Fragility that um, was very impactful in terms of her um, understanding the idea of white privilege um, in a way that perhaps she hadn't. Um, please correct me if I'm misspeaking for anybody, um, but that, those were my takeaways. So uh, I'm going to interrupt for a second just to say I put together a resource book, which everyone should have received by email. This is hardly the definitive list of materials, but these are just um, a few pages from some books and some articles, just a few things to spark conversation and thought. And the, uh, the Human Relations Commission is looking to bring the author, Robin D'Angelo, of Right White Facility to Philadelphia next fall. Group two. Thank you, Beryl. Okay, group three. Anybody who wants to share their thoughts? Oh, yeah. This, this is back to group two, sorry. Uh, one thing that struck me was, um, oh boy, where's the uh, Rachel? No. Anyway, the, oh, Nancy, Nancy Cohn brought up the issue of uh, Jews being slaves, but also owning slaves in America. So kind of, uh, yeah. that, and dealing with what it means to be white. So. This is Dan Siegel from, from group group two, there being nobody else to summarize. I, I can say a couple of words. Um, the, some of the, a lot of the sort of dialogue when it's to me anyway, came down to feeling, feeling Jewish in terms of identity, but carrying the, in a sense, some of the burden of being white, uh, thought was was articulated that whiteness to some extent, because it's so multicultural, given that all of us are immigrants in one way or another, really comes down in a large, in large part in the United States to being not black. Uh, recognition by the people, people in, in the group was um, 
was strong of the sort of um, racism that inf infects the, the white community implicitly and explicitly. We do our best and with some success to empathize with a black community, but it's tough to walk in their shoes. Group three. Marcy will resend that email. Group three. All right, we're going to make it just a free for all. Anybody who would like to share. I can chime in. I'm Melissa Bodie, and um, I was the one. Uh, who referred to white fragility. I was saying in the group that I identify as white because I've benefited from my whiteness my whole life. And um, having said that, I didn't really understand or acknowledge the concept of whiteness until I read Robin DiAngelo's book. I never framed it in that way. I never understood it as, I knew I was privileged, but I never understood it as um, a concept of whiteness. So it really blew the lid off everything I, learn and I needed to do a lot of very fast unlearning and I'm still on you know the long the long journey to it um, but and now I'm trying to educate our daughters in their whiteness and their their young youngest children um, and it's I was mentioning that during the time of COVID even though we're stuck at home um, the the absorption of you know, us and other and who these essential workers are and who are delivering the food, um, they understand that it's not, you know, it's not people who look like us. Um, mm -hmm. So they've raised some questions about that. And it's just been, um, you know, now is it's such a, it's such an peeling back of all the racist layers. It's just, it's all right here in front of all of us, even if we um, never were aware of it before as white people. Some people still are unaware, even when it is right in front of them. Hi, this is Elliot Ratzman. I want to tell. I want to say that in Philadelphia, I'm I, I'm white, but when I was teaching in Wisconsin, I was not. I was in northern Wisconsin, and I wore a kippa and marked differently than whiteness in the area. If I was in Israel, I would be certainly white because I'm not Arab and I'm not Mizrahi, but in Poland or in Hungary, I would not be white. I would see, be seen as something other than the dominant power structure. So it depends on power and perception where you are. Uh, certainly in America, we, we, we benefit from white privilege, but Jews also do not identify readily with the white supremacy that wants to cordon off whiteness as a political project. Um. This is Mina. I, um, <clears throat> I'm from DC um, and I wanted to thank Bacha for letting me come. Um, but I also wanted to credit, I told my group that I wanted to credit a Philadelphian, uh, Rabbi Mordecai Liebling for the formulation of um, provisional whiteness. I'm sure he did not invent this, but he offered this in a, um, a workshop that he gave for my congregation um, with a fellow named Gray Higgins. Um, but provisional whiteness, which is the idea that um, as Jews, we uh, we live as white Jews. We live as white people in this country, and so we have all of we've acquired all of the expectations of a white person. Um, but because of anti-Semitism and because of that, whiteness is aspirational and a social construct. That privilege can be taken away, and that we like can be taken away. So we can have it for decade, decades, centuries, and then gone. Um, so. Yeah, that's all I wanted to offer. Okay, so I'm now going to share the list that I've put together of how Jews identify. And thank you, Mina. Um, I really appreciate your coming on. All right, so one way Jews identify, Jews who look white. Some Jews identify just as white. Also, contingent whiteness, off-white, passing as white, functionally white, provisionally white, not yet white, or almost white. And like all things, when you're dealing with Jews, the answer is always going to be it's complicated. Right? It's a safe answer. If somebody asks you a question about Judaism or the Jewish tradition or the Jewish community, well, you know, it's complicated. 
it's just a safe answer. It's like in rabbinical school, if you don't know the answer to a question, you say, well, there's a disagreement. Because you just you just know it's always it's always a true answer. Right? So for Jews, it's complicated. Are we white? Yes. We definitely benefit from looking white mm -hmm. in America. But this is Hello? kind of provisional. Who was that? Not connected. All right, so um, I will will share with you that when I used to go to Adit Israel back in DC, there was one year where the two rabbis gave two sermons. One sermon was Jews are white, and the other sermon was Jews are not white. Um, and I think the, uh, I'm not sure they ever came to understand, they were actually giving the same sermon, but talking to different people. Um, for the rabbi who thought it was important that we recognize that we are white, it was a sermon about recognizing that we have the privileges and, the, the, and everything that is conveyed in America by get, being white. Um, for the rabbi who gave the sermon that we are not white, um, he had the opportunity to acknowledge the diversity, uh, the racial diversity, the ethnic diversity within the Jewish community. And also, please remember that we should be standing alongside other communities that are not white. Oh, Jesus. Uh, Minna, you can just talk. Oh, me? All right, Minna froze. There you are. I'm sorry, because I've been muted the whole time, so I didn't realize it finally came on. Sorry. Oh, well, welcome. Well, I've just been listening, because I didn't think anybody could hear me, because you couldn't. Now, all of a sudden, you can hear me. So it's wonderful to have you. Who am I, who's talking, please, because I don't see you. No. Uh, my name is Eleanor Goodman, Ellie Goodman. Hi, Ellie. And, Glad we can hear you now. Well, I find some of it very funny. I mean, some of it very unrealistic. In what way? Uh, well, well, I grew up the opposite of person in South Philly. I grew up in West Philly, and you were either Catholic or Jewish. And uh, the Black people... We're just starting to cross over Market Street, Chestnut, Walnut, Chestnut Street, Walnut Street, coming up the way. When my parents moved to Mount Airy, it was all white, but I went to Germantown High, which was prominently black. But we never thought of black or white. Um, they were, we were all just teenagers. Nobody said you're black, nobody said you're white. We piled together, etc., etc. Never thought of color. I went to nursing school. I had uh, homosexuals, a couple of blacks, if anything. They were very high class blacks and looked down on everybody. And um, quite honestly, I never ever really came across anything in my life that said, well, you're white or black or Jewish, if anything, Jewish. Now that I have grandchildren who are all above in college and above college, the thing that we talk about when we get together is the fact that if you're white and Jewish, you, it, you are now in the minority. It is very hard to get into some of your best universities if you're not black, if you're not Asian, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it seems to be just the reverse. They have a priority. And if you're white and Jewish, that's, that's a double sting, stinger. And um, I have four grandchildren that were three were born in Israel and came here. One was born here. They're now all in Israel. They were always taken for black because their father is uh, uh, Sephardic. Uh, so they are very dark. Uh, they were never looked upon differently than anybody else. They never had a problem. White, black, dark. If anything, their problem was being Jewish. 
Kelly, did you ever ask them if they had a problem for being? Yes. Oh, yes. We're very close. Of course I did. Of course I did. They went had, They went to Cheltenham High School in Philadelphia. Very mixed. Extremely mixed. They had black friends, Asian friends, white friends. They were always known as Jewish. That's what they were known as. Uh, we used to go down the shore in the summertime because I had a place. In the beginning, the people at the desk, they used to think that I had black granddaughters. They never ever said, oh, no, I'm white or, or I'm black or anything. They just, um, they were Jewish. That's been my experience. And like I said, if anything now, the problems have been getting into universities. If you're white and Jewish, uh, you're, you're not, you're... Your last get get in the back of the line because I do you're... not think that that is statistically reflected. Um, I don't know about statistics. I well, I'm not talk. I'm just talking about. So I wanted uh, to say I don't want to uh, speak over, but I wanted to say I went to. Um, so my undergrad was at Temple University, and my master's is at University of Penn. And my fiance and I we sat and we actually looked at like universities that have high Jewish populations, and most of them are the Ivies, Brown being the highest, um, and University of Pennsylvania having a high Jewish population. Um, I, I can't say that I, I know that experience. However, my family has been in Philadelphia since the 1920s. Um, and I will say my father joined the army and left because of discrimination, having a high ranking officer who was white and one who was white and Jewish. So. Uh, I think it's it's variable where people are. My mm -hmm. parents went to school here in the 80s. My grandparents here in the 60s. My great grandmother got married in Philadelphia mm -hmm. in 1924. So we've been here for a while. I will say um, I didn't I didn't see people as Jewish. I thought white people were white. Um, the same way I think people think black people are black. Whether the distinguish the distinguishment is whether they're Haitian or West African or uh, Jamaican or something like that. Like I always thought that white people were white and black people were black. I never had a real distinction until meeting a person and sit them saying, oh, I'm Jewish. And I said, oh, okay, I, I didn't really understand that. And I think actually the American Jewish History Museum in Philadelphia talks about the difference or, or when Jews became white in the 50s and being able to make the choice I think is the difference for certain people, like I can't make a choice whether I'm black or not. Like I can never choose to not be black. Like that's not, phenotypically I cannot walk into the room and say, um, and even be Rachel Dolezal and say, I'm transracial, I, I identify as, I can be Jewish, but I'll still be a black Jew, which is still different than white Judaism or not Judaism being a white Jew. Um, so I think part of that is how you're looked at phenotypically but then also how, I think a lot of people say my identity as, is as a Jewish person and that's your identity, but my, what phenotypically will the rest of the world see you as and how will you be treated in that community or in different communities, right? Like if I walk into a room and say, I'm a very educated black person, that doesn't necessarily matter to someone if I never open my mouth, right? Um, I get, I have been told that when I got into Penn, I got in because I was black. Like I literally had someone say those words to me. Oh, you got in because you're black. And and to, to think about my finishing GPA or even going through that school. I mean, I sat in classrooms where I was one of three people of color and one being um, a Bahamian person uh, immigrating from the Bahamas, one being a person from, um, uh, Grenada, uh, yeah, a, a Caribbean island, another Caribbean island, and us, and we would have these conversations, but when people asked us questions, they would look at us three, when they asked any question that was non-white, and we had many conversations with um, our Jewish counterparts in that classroom to say, I can't walk into this place if I'm wearing the Star of David, and that to me was disconcerting, but I can't take off my, my, my Star of David. I can't take off what was God given to me? I have to walk into a room being black and thinking about that um, in in every experience that I have. I haven't 
um, ever, I think the only time, and it's funny that you brought up the book White Fragility, the only time I've ever walked into a room and felt like I could be just my, just me without my blackness was in the White Privilege Conference where I met Robin D'Angelo because everybody was courteous to me. And I was like, okay, let me go sit in a park and see if this extends outside of this room with all of these other people who are consciously thinking about their race. But it didn't last very long. I don't get to not be black. Um, there is not a, there is a, there's an always distinction because it's what people think I am when I enter a room, how I talk, um, what I say, the perceived notion of when I get angry, all of those things amalgamated into, into one. And I will say, I, I, I may be, I'm not sure if I'm, I thought about that. The first thing I said as we were muted in this conversation was, are, are the people in this conversation going to be able to have open, honest conversation with me being a black person in this room? Will they be, will they be able to speak up and talk about their own experiences or whatever um, internalized racism or racism that they face or have uh, perpetrated against another with a black person in the room that is always, um, as a person who does diversity work, that it's always a risk when you are uh, the minority or people are gonna be able to have that honest conversation with other folks around. And as, as we continue the conversation, that's always gonna be the most important decision, distinction is that we are talking about how Jews who look white self-identify. And not that there aren't, addition, aren't issues of how we are perceived elsewhere, but a lot of these issues are about who we are and who, how we see ourselves and how we're bringing that to our perception of racism and our perception of the conversation. Certainly, other people's perception of Jews who look white is that we're white. Adrian, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, um, I think I think that that's a bit of the problem. If you, I look white, so I can go about my day not being followed, and well, not the last two months, but you know, I could go about my day not be followed in the grocery in, in the store. I can I I can. Uh, walk out of the store with the item not in a bag and not with a receipt and have nobody stop me. The, these are things that, that um, I don't have to worry about. And, um, Correct. and if you say, oh, I'm Jewish to put me in another, another box, okay, I, I, don't, I don't wear a wig. I'm not religious, so. Um, but if somebody who's anti-Semitic is finds out I'm Jewish, there'll be a different reaction. But they have to find it out. All right. So and what we're that's what the and I think that's a difference when you're saying, "Oh, are you white or you're Jewish?" If if you present as white that's what your experience in society is going to be unless you let them know otherwise. Okay. So let me be explicit. We need to talk about how we see anti-Semitism and our own identities because it is very hard for often when Jews engage in conversations about racism not to refer to anti-Semitism. So I wanna make sure we have an opportunity to talk about what anti-Semitism is the ways in which it is not like racism, and while holding an understanding of all the dangers and importance of anti-Semitism, the ability to have this conversation without bringing up anti-Semitism. Right? We should know what anti-Semitism is. We should know it's important, but if you can't have a conversation without referring to racism, without referring to about racism, without referring to anti-Semitism, you're making it impossible to have a conversation about racism. Right? So I want to make sure we take a few minutes to talk about what anti-Semitism is and isn't. Right? Because just because we need to know what we're talking about so we can talk about racism. All right, so I'm, have, has anyone heard of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism? Now that was in a link that we sent today. Was any was was anybody really conscientious and and took a minute and opened up that link? 
Somebody want to read yes. the little box at the beginning for me? I have to find it. But Jason is his name. Yeah. Run on you. It's Daniel Siegel. Dan, everyone can hear you. You can unmute yourselves. If you just have to look at the bottom left, there's a mute button. You can unmute yourselves. Jason, can you find that quote and read it so we don't? Um, yeah, I can read it. I have it right in front of me. I'm just trying to get class participation. So no, just, just read it. <laughs> read it. Anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred toward Jews. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed toward Jewish or non-Jewish individuals and their property toward Jewish community institutions and re religious facilities. Okay, that seems pretty straightforward, but I'm going to read one of the examples they give, and they give a ex lot of examples. I'm going to encourage everyone to read all those examples, but we're going to start, I'm just going to read this one. This is the way that anti-Semitism is not like racism. Making mendacious, dehumanizing, demonizing, or stereotypical allegations about Jews such as such, or the power of Jews as collectives, such as, especially, but not exclusively, the myth about a world conspiracy or of Jews controlling the media, economy, government, or other societal institutions. Right? That idea that Jews are this evil force controlling the universe, that's anti that is anti-Semitism. That's a conspiracy theory. And that is a, that is a way in which we are not, anti-Semitism is not like racism. I'm just going to read a couple more, a few more lines. You'll see in the resource book you received, there's a section from Barry Weiss's book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism. On page 31, it begins that anti-Semitism is an ever-morphing conspiracy theory in which Jews play the starring role in spreading evil in the world. And if you read down to the middle of the next page, it ends with the quote, all comes from the Jew and all returns to the Jew. Right? You'll see examples of these things in political cartoons all the time. Anybody want to think of a few? All right. If you see George Soros as a puppet master, right? that image of Jews as puppet master controlling the politicians and a secret cabal controlling the power in the world. Right. That's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory. Yeah, this right. if you used see to be the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds. Right? Um, the politicians with piles of money. Uh, we control banking, right? That's the Rothschilds. We control the media. We're responsible for our coronavirus. Right? If you I, my son actually showed me a video from the Flat Earthers Convention. And did you know that we're responsible for the myth that the Earth is round? <laughs> right. Who knew? Who knew? There's a cartoon where one guy is reading a, a disturmer and somebody says, Why are you, Jewish guy, why are you reading the disturmer? And they said, Well, when I read our press, I find out how oppressed we are. But when I read the Sturmer, I find out we're actually controlling everybody. It feels great. Right? Um, Anti-Semitism is a fundamentally different experience than racism. Not that there's not a racial, racial element to it. There is, especially the, the, the anti-Semitism that you would have seen in Nazi Germany. However, it is not the same thing as racism. It does not mean that we are always safe. It does not always mean that we are always um, comfortable, but it is just a different thing. Right? And I just want to make sure that when we go into conversations about race, we remember not to talk about how anti-Semitism is just like racism, because that does not give credit to what anti-Semitism, the true dangers of anti-Semitism, and it doesn't give space to understand what racism really is. 
Um, I have a list of vocabulary. I'm going to send you off into your breakout rooms again. You didn't know you, you okay. Do you have pens? Because nobody opened their books. Right. One of the great joys of adult ed is people are only there because they want to be, but the downside, nobody does their homework. Right. I got a list of words. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read you a few words. Can you write them down? We just need one person to group for the group to have the list of words I gave you. Um you just write, write down a few and you I want you to share your reflections and any words you think should be on this list that you don't hear, right? Privilege, racism, intersectionality, right, white fragility, identity politics, cultural appropriation, proximity. I can't write that fast. I, okay, sorry. I didn't know that anyone was actually gonna bother to write, so I just read fast. <laughs> I'll start again and read more slowly. So racism. Privilege, intersectionality, white fragility, identity politics, cultural appropriation, proximity, structural or systematic racism, internalized oppression, and power. You know what? I can type these, can't I? I'll type them into the chat. <laughs> but the chat, some people already did. And the chat and, can oh. show up in the breakout room, so people so still can write it down. A possibility I is to, to I couldn't after, the a possibility is to text, is to text the groups after we already go to the breakout sessions. Yeah, I'll be uh, okay. splitting the groups up and I'll broadcast a message with all these words to each of the Great. breakout groups. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Jason, if you want, I can send you an email with the list. If you have, if you have a resource book that was sent to you. I have them, so I'm going to do the breakout groups right now, and I will shortly okay. after send. Be, Jason, before you do the breakout groups, what's the question again, Batya? So the questions are, what do you think these words mean? What is your emotional reaction to these terms? And what words are missing from this list? No list of. Mm -hmm. That's what I have to figure out there. I think I can also. Intersectionality. Oh, I should be able to share. What is the list representing? What's that? What is the list representing? When you say what's missing. So you froze, but I'll. But the the list represents words that I thought it is by no means an exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. It is a list of words that are newer to the conversation about racism. Okay. So racism, not anti-Semitism. No, this is, we are, we're done. Okay. We're, we're done. on racism now. We're done with anti-Semitism. Got it. it. Okay. We go into. Oh, okay. I'm in four.
I will say that it's an, it is an interesting experience that to look at people and you don't know I'm looking at you. Like, you, you know that experience when you're actually in a room with people and you get to make eye contact and smile and nod? Here I just smile and nod at the screen and nobody has any idea who I'm smiling and nodding at. So I guess, I guess it works for everybody. <laughs> So is, is, are we all back? We're all back. So I want to say something that I said in my small group, which is I have been very surprised by these conversations because I had I am used to talking to people who who are have great difficulty talking about racism without talking about anti-Semitism. They can't they they're so um, their own vision of their understanding of how anti-Semitism works in the world means they can't talk about race without talking about anti-Semitism. And that's a distraction from the conversation, right? But from what I can tell everybody in this group gets that. Um, I know I have been in endless conversations where the idea of white privilege makes people really angry like people you wouldn't expect to be made angry or just get furious at the idea that they're privileged and don't I understand their lives are hard and who could think they were privileged. But I haven't found anybody in this group to have any um, particular issue with that. Everybody seems to be owning uh, white privilege fairly right. enthusiastically. Well, we're a self-selecting group that came uh, to talk about this, right? Okay. Like, so it kind of makes sense, you know? It does at the same time, that's what I would have thought on the civil rights mission. And yet I found on the civil rights mission, all of those issues were in play. You would have thought that people who would go on a mission to the South would have had a chance to consider the ideas of privilege and to consider, you know, talking about race without talking about anti-Semitism. And I did not find that to be universally the case at all. So I expected this group to more or less reflect the group that went on the civil rights mission, which was much more diverse in that way. So we don't have a lot of time and I wanna make sure we actually have at least one conversation that's actually geared to the group. So the only word that was challenging in my small group was the word intersectionality. Were there any other words that people felt deserved a conversation here? We spent a lot of time discussing cultural appropriation. We added microaggressions to the um, conversation because it wasn't on there, um, on the list, in class. We did too. Class isn't on there yet. And we talked about fragility. Okay, so we, we have about 15 minutes left. So let's talk about those four, four or five words for just a few minutes. Um, hmm. I'm, what do people want to talk about first? Let's do, can we do cultural appropriation? Because there was a comment I wanted to make on that that I didn't get to when we were in the group. And I think that there's a difference between honoring a culture and appropriating. And to me, you're appropriating if you're making money off it. Hmm. So that that's that's kind of how I see it. When um, the women went down to um, a town in Mexico and took a recipe and then made a lot of money out, out of it in the US. And they didn't give anything back to the community where they took took that from. That to me is cultural appropriation. Somebody's um, somebody's beautiful Egyptian hanging that they have on the wall. That to me is appreciation. But you know that's just my definition, and who am I? But well, you're part of the conversation. <laughs> so what do people think about Kylie Jenner in? in uh... Farmer, farmer, and like the yeah. She's sure making money it. off it. It's appropriation. The, may I say something? The the woman I don't remember names and I don't remember specifics, but there was a woman who worked in the NAACP and passed as black and called herself black 
Rachel and yet Ellison. her parents said, excuse me, but you're white. And there was this huge hysteria over this. To me, that would be class appropriation. Um, you're not class, but whatever, racial appropriation, whatever you were talking about. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. me, that was somebody who w wanted to be something she wasn't. I was having a conversation with a high school classmate of mine today who is African American, and she was saying how um, the former fire chief of Philadelphia, um, who was born in the South, but was light skinned and had blue eyes, he self identified when he went to register to vote as black. And the person who signed him up said, you may regret that because in her mind, he could have passed as white and she, and she felt, whoever this woman was, uh, and it was probably 70 <laughs> years ago, that if he would have been better off passing as white for the rest of his life. Just right, making that's a little different than cultural appropriation now. That, that's been an interesting conversation, but. Um, I think when you add into it, not just um, profiting, but benefiting in any large scale way to add to that. So um, we think about one of the things that we, we kind of dilute now, we don't really talk about cultural appropriation is how often uh, white people will go to like a yoga studio that's not ran by a, uh, an Indian person. It's or a Zumba that's run by a white woman but doesn't have any cultural tie to the heritage that it came from. Um, some of those things, some we accept, some we don't. And it's kind of hard to figure out sometimes where the line is drawn for folks. Like I would say, if you have a dream catcher that wasn't made for you or given to you by a Native American person, you may be appropriating that culture because you don't, um, it, you, if you bought it from Target, Right, Target is doing right is doing that a part of that a cultural appropriation as well. Um, I think, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that you make a really important part. It's, 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 it's hard to peg it. Like, what what are the things that people are comfortable with with, and what aren't? Like, is it more appropriate to talk about yoga as part of a wider spiritual Buddhist tradition, or is it more appropriate to talk about yoga as an exercise program? Right, when somebody objects to yoga in schools because, well, it's a religious practice, so you shouldn't have it in schools. Is that person being more culturally accepting or less? Like, it's really, it is a tough call. And I can't really figure out when is when is it a cultural appropriation and when is it uh, appropriate embrace of a cultural practice. But we should all be thinking about it. Um, this is Gillian. My biggest issue with uh, cultural appropriation is that, um, for instance, talking about braids, when it's done by a white person, uh, that person is considered trending, daring, um, exciting. So many positive um, adjectives are added to that person. But when it's done by a black person, like for instance, I'm choosing to wear braids, but I also I understand that by wearing braids as an attorney or someone working uh, for the government, I'm making a statement. Just wearing braids, wearing braids is not just wearing braids. When I walk around in my braids, people look at me and they think certain way about me what I'm choosing to do and how I'm expected to behave and my level of professionalism. So when we do things at, as black people, it's viewed negatively. When white people do the very thing, the very thing we do or we've done, they're looked at positively. So it's not just cultural uh, appropriation as the, our culture is being stolen, it's that our culture in someone else's hands take a different connotation than when we do it. So that's my issue. I don't have a problem with uh, whoever wearing braids, but I want people to look at me the same way. 
and see, oh, it's pretty, but it's not. It, it's not considered pretty to wear braids as a black person, but it's considered pretty for Jenner to wear braids. That's my problem. I think I just express a problem with racism, and I would say we're generally supportive of that. It's a problem. You're right. No question about that. Um, I want to make sure we get to, um, well, I want to make sure we get to intersectionality. Does somebody want to give a, a definition of intersectionality? And then we can talk about what, in what ways that concept has been co-opted. Well, I, in our group, I sort of expressed concern about intersectionality. I mean, I think it's, it's where you're trying to see that um, th there's a way to bring together groups or to view groups um, that we sometimes think of as being different um, or, or, or uh, put another way, that issues can cross groups. So, you know, that, so that there can be, um, it's not, well, it's not only black people that are uh, disproportionately affected by uh, coronavirus. It's also Latinos, or maybe it's also Appalachians, um, some other groups. I, I think, so then that's, that's seeing those different racial or ethnic groups as sort of connected in some way. Um, and I think that the, the positive aspect of that can be that um, people may realize, hey, we ought to work together. We, we, we share, that there's power in numbers. It becomes a power issue. The, 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 what sort of concerns me is that intersectionality can be used as a way to avoid talking about the specifics that are that are felt differently um, by different groups. So you know, if you try, if you throw anti-Semitism and racism and ageism, and, uh, you know, all together, you can avoid talking about all three of them in any meaningful way. Now, maybe I'm not, not de defining intersectionality well, but. Uh, that, that's been my concern about the concept. Well, from my understanding of the concept um, is that, for instance, if I were a lesbian, uh, I would be dealing with three forms of discrimination. So I would be subjected to discrimination as a woman, as a Black woman, and as a black lesbian. So it's the fact that when you are in different, uh, when you identify, it's based on gender, race, religion, you can be subject to different sectors of discrimination. And when, when you're dealing with people who fit those different, um, into these different section or boxes, you have to be mindful to, to not, you have to be mindful to respect every single area of identification. Okay, so you froze, so I'm going to talk for a minute. Um, so my son is getting his degree in American studies, uh, sorted, uh, cited the original source, which is it's like being stuck in an intersection. So we'll use the example of black lesbian woman. If you're standing in the intersection, you can get hit by all three directions, right? It's not just one direction, it's, it's complicated, right? And our identities are complicated. Um, the idea that we are all in it together, there was recently, I don't know if you saw the movie Crip Camp, Judy Human, it's uh, about the, the Judy Human and the uh, work for disability rights for, for the disabilities community. And she talks about how when they were uh, occupying the government building out in San Francisco, uh, the Black Panthers brought the meals because they were fighting for, for justice and for representation in the government. And the Black Panthers felt they were, they were working together. That was the same issue. 
right? So those are the ways in which these issues work really well together. Um, intersectionality has also become a word that is, becomes used for identifying Jews as the white oppressors and um, others as, oh, yes, my son is, is cited, wants me to cite that the piece was written by Kimberly Crenshaw. Thank you, no. Um, the, the idea of intersectionality, oh, don't leave, Jeremy, not now. The, uh, when Jews become the white oppressors and the um, whoever else, right, the Palestinians become the oppressed people of color and Jews become the white supremacists, when the idea of intersectionality is co-opted to mean that, it becomes challenging. Right, Zionism gets added to lists of oppression like racism. Right. Um, and that brings us pretty much to the end, which is a difficult place to stop. So do we want to talk about that for just a couple of minutes before we have to leave? We're good. Okay, so for our next, oh, in our lean square. Yeah, I would just like to say that, I mean, I'm just kind of um, in on this conversation, but um, I, I think that all of these words and these phrases and these understandings are very difficult when not considered against the backdrop of American history and even world history. Because, you know, no matter how you're going to slice it, demonization of Black people, people of African descent, has no parallel. There's nothing else like it um, in terms of both the slave trade. I mean, and I'm saying in terms of the modern era, from the time of this, you know, the Columbus in this part of the world and the amount that's been written, the amount of ink spilled is really unbelievably large. And so, I mean, I think that anybody who wants to try to do or act in this space owes it to themselves to do a lot of reading and studying and just reading as broadly as possible. Because these, these words and these concepts are like landmines without having a broader understanding. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a place to start a conversation, not to end one. Yeah. I think about, uh, maybe I'm not so clear with how intersectionality has been used in the way that you're describing, because what you described to me doesn't sound like what intersectionality means, because it is about the complexity of identity. And I think it's a really useful way to think about Ashkenazi Jews and Jews who are white because we're, the nature of anti-Semitism and racism intersect so that we are both oppressed and oppressor at the same time. Like, um, and, and, no, go no, sorry, go ahead. And just in that sense, I find intersectionality in the way it was first used by Kimberly Crenshaw useful in unpacking that. I think it can be both useful and detrimental. And like, I would say for me, I experience a lot of racism from gay white men Right. So those are two identities um, as white, but then as a as a predominantly part of a large group and then part of a marginalized group where people, if they don't recognize where their where their privilege lies or are fighting against that privilege, like a lot of people will say um, or what, what I have heard and some of what I've experienced is that gay white men, some of their fights stopped when marriage equality happened. Right. So if you experience more privilege than marginalization in your identity, maybe even in your everyday, then you can also, you can forget what it's like to be a part of, part of a marginalized group and then take on parts of the dominant culture. And I think that can happen in, in, in uh, uh, what uh, a Rabbi Glazer was saying. So people can take on part of that Larry, identity and it can become Larry. enmeshed easy, with huh? each other in how they uh, present or even work through in the world. I have had um, like gay white men say they identify and they understand my intersections or my intersectionality because they also have a marginalized identity, but those are not the same, right? Or then they, or, or it becomes challenging when they can't um, untangle themselves from understanding how they walk through the world versus more more uh, more marginalized identities or, or how many can be compounded against each okay. other. Okay, um, so you've been trying that this evening? David, we can all hear you. David, <laughs> he's muted now. Right. Okay. 
Sorry. So just so you know, but, um, Rachel, I wasn't saying what it is. I'm saying ways in which I've heard the term used. Okay. Um, so we're, at, we're actually supposed to stop at 8.30. Uh, and I apologize. I, my expectations were totally not appropriate to this group. <laughs> um, and, but I have to tell you again, my expectations of down at the civil rights trip to Atlanta and Alabama, totally not appropriate to that group either. Fred, hi. So um, all in all, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I really appreciate the, the chance to have this conversation and I will prepare much less for next week so that it, we all have more of an opportunity to talk through. I'll just bring a couple of, a couple of short pieces. I'll make sure they're sent in advance. Uh, people, so. Um, I, yeah. did, I didn't realize that the email you sent was anything more than a reminder. Um, so I, I apologize for that. Um, so maybe if you could say homework in the, thingy so yep i'll put it in the subject line my sense was if i sent it at the last minute then it would be easily accessible but it also made it easily missable so right. i will i will yeah put i get like 200 in. emails a day right I, some I, of us worked right up until the time this meeting started so we did there there was no time to read it because we were working i totally i didn't i didn't actually expect anyone to read it i thought we could possibly have it <laughs> have it with us at the time I, I, again, I never expect people to do their homework because that's just not really. <laughs> um, and the, so I, we will resend all the readings to make sure that everyone has them. They are not definitive. This is not the definitive list. These are just some selections that address some of these issues and raise some of these questions. Um, and some of them, next, the next conversation is about the black, the relationship between the black and Jewish communities. Um, so you, and you will find some pieces in there uh, about that, right? Uh, including, a, well, you'll find it, you'll look. Uh, so thank you all very much. This was really fun. Thank um, so uh, we'll, we'll uh, see you next week. Don't forget to count the Omer. And for those of you who I'm just meeting, it's really good to meet you. I look forward to continuing yeah. the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It went too fast. <laughs>